Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. I know I've been a little MIA lately. You guys haven't had a video in like, what, roughly a week? I took a little trip with my family to spend some time with the kids over February break, and honestly, with the kids being off of school for February break, there wasn't much of a chance of me getting anything done anyways. But I am back. I know the setup today is a little bit different. I'm sitting on the other side of my couch facing the other way, but that is because this case today includes a lot of text messages. And in order to get them right, I didn't want to retype them into my notes. I wanted to read them directly from the document. So I have the document up on my computer and that is why I'm over here so that I can refer to my computer when I'm reading the text to you. Now I know in last week's live, I gave you guys a little peek on what my next videos were gonna be on. However, I had to pivot a little bit because a case that I have been following for several years pretty closely, it kind of came to a head and had a final decision on it this month. And because the case was so important to me, I felt compelled to make a video about that. This case is the suicide of Conrad Roy III and the involvement of his girlfriend, Michelle Carter, in his death. This case was so important and I feel compelled to make a video about it because this was the case where his girlfriend, Michelle Carter, had basically talked him into committing suicide via text message. I have a lot of thoughts about this case. There's a lot of information on this case, so we are going to get started right after a word from our sponsor. Now, I understand that there are some people who have a problem with me bringing sponsorships into every video and I don't bring them into every video for for instance, my Scott Peterson series that I just did, I believe I only talked about a sponsor in one out of three of those videos. However, you have to understand that especially if you've been following me recently, YouTube has been messing with my monetization. They disabled all comments on every single one of my videos a couple of days ago because of this new issue with this guy who's on YouTube talking about child endangerment, even though none of my videos have minors in them somehow somehow my comment section was destroyed and it took me a long time to get that back and it's just been a mess lately so i do have to bring sponsorships into these videos because every single video i do every case i do you have to understand the amount of work and effort and hours of my time that goes into creating the videos. For instance, this case that I'm talking about now, I probably spent about 14 to 16 hours researching. It took me another five to six hours to get all my notes into an actually like organized manner and format that I could then tell you the story. And you know, hours and hours of editing and it's just a lot of work and I love doing it for you guys and I really hope you guys love that I do it, but this is my full-time job now, so I do have to find a way to profit from the video in some way so I can continue to make this content for you guys, especially when YouTube or the advertisers or whoever, whoever is responsible, is messing around with my my money a little bit. So that is why I bring sponsors in every so often. You can fast forward through it if you want, but if you want to support me and you want to listen to the sponsorship for a quick couple of minutes, even if you want to go ahead and use the company that I'm talking about in order to support me further, you've already been thinking about doing it or it's something you're interested in after hearing me talk about it, that's great. Otherwise, you know, fast forward through, you don't have to listen, nobody's keeping you hostage here, but it is something that I need to do in order to continue to provide you with this content. With that being said, today's sponsor of this video is Audible. Audible is amazing. You guys hear me talk about it often. I love Audible, and if you haven't signed up for your free one month trial yet, give it a shot. Audible has over 140,000 titles to choose from. You can listen to it on your phone, on your tablet. You can listen to it in the car. You can listen to it while you're working out. If you don't have time to sit down and read a book, it is the best way to get the information in. I know there's so many times that I'm like, I really wanna read that book, but I don't have time. So I just pop it on on Audible and I go about my day. I am also working with getting different sponsors so that you don't have to hear about Audible every time, but you guys always know if you want to try it, the link is in my description box of almost every video. And I am really so picky about getting sponsors, not that they haven't been offered because they have, but I only want to suggest to you guys things that I would use myself or that I actually like or that I actually believe in. So 
Although many sponsorships have been thrown my way, I don't accept them because it's possibly something I wouldn't use or I'm not familiar enough with the company or I just don't think it fits what you guys would want. So I am a little picky with my sponsors, but Audible has always been great to me. Audible is something I use every single day, so I feel completely comfortable suggesting it to you guys. Also, if you want to join me for our Friday Night Wine and True Crime this coming Friday, I am going to be going into greater detail about the whole issue with my comment section being disabled, what's going on with YouTube recently, and what I think about it. Cause you know, we always get a little crazy and loose on our Wine and True Crime Fridays. Let's get started. On July 12, 2014, 18-year-old Conrad Roy III took a walk with his golden retriever, Holly. When he got back home, his mother asked him if he wanted to go with her and her sisters to Horse Neck Beach in Westport, Massachusetts. He and his mother walked along the beach and they chatted about how he had just been offered a four-year scholarship to attend the same college as his best friend was going to. Afterwards, Connor brought his sisters Camden and Morgan to get ice cream, and his sisters and his mother said he seemed normal that day, hopeful, happy. He did seem a little bit distracted by his cell phone, he was texting quite a bit, but otherwise he seemed just like his normal self. When they got home about 6.30 that evening, Conrad told his mother he was going to be visiting a friend and that he probably wouldn't be back home for dinner. He then drove his black Ford F-250 truck to a Kmart parking lot. He placed a portable water pump powered by a gasoline engine in the back seat. He got into the truck, closed the doors, shut all the windows, and started running the water pump. Within minutes, his truck had filled up with lethal carbon monoxide, and Connor Roy was gone, his life over before it even really began. In August of 2017, a young woman named Michelle Carter was sentenced to 15 months in prison for involuntary manslaughter. The prosecution said she was responsible for Conrad's death because she had coerced him into doing it via text. What could have led a young man with a very promising future ahead of him to commit suicide? What could have led a young woman who claimed to be his girlfriend and who claimed to love him to take part in his committing suicide? to help him plan it, to bully him into doing it. Let's find out who Conrad Roy was and who Michelle Carter was and how when the two met, it changed both of their paths forever. Conrad was born on September 12th, 1995 in the seaside community of Mattapoisett, Massachusetts. His family described him as a goofy kid, kind of an instigator. He was always the one who would start trouble, but he always seemed to actually avoid getting into trouble. They called him Coco for short because his father was Conrad Roy Jr. and his grandfather was Conrad Roy Sr. And since they called Conrad's father Co, they thought Coco would have been a fitting name for his son. He was athletic, he played baseball in high school, and he could often be found wearing a Boston Red Sox cap because it was his favorite baseball team. He was really smart too. He graduated from high school with a 3.88 GPA which earned him a free ride to Fitchburg State University where he planned on studying business. He loved being on the water and he was basically born into it. His father and his grandfather ran a family marine salvage business and he would often work with them. He even achieved the impressive accomplishment of earning his captain's license at the age of 18. At the time of his death, he was trying to decide whether he should attend college or if he should just skip it and go right to work for his family business where he figured he would end up anyways. A lot of promise in such a young man. So what went wrong? It seemed like the catalyst to Conrad's mental issues began when his parents divorced in 2011. Divorce can hit kids really hard, and it often does. I remember when I was seven and my parents separated, I really didn't understand what was going on. I just knew my mom was crying and sad all the time, and my dad, who used to be around every day, no longer was. Conrad would have been around 15 when his parents divorced, and you might think that it's easier for an older child to handle the stress and the change that a divorce can bring to a family, but in fact, that's not always true. This is the time in adolescence when children are going to try to gain autonomy from their parents and become more independent. 
Even though teenagers are trying to pull away from their parents and establish themselves as a separate entity, they still need to know that their parents are there to fall back on, that they have a good and strong relationship and bond with their parents, that everything is healthy and okay at home. Parents divorcing at this time and in adolescence development can interrupt this process. It can cause the teen to feel like his or her parents are separating from them instead of the other way around. This is also the time when depression is more likely in a child's life to rear its ugly head. The additional stress of his parents divorcing added to the already boiling turmoil of emotions and hormones that were raging. This pushed him over the edge and it caused some emotional problems, including depression and social anxiety. He began seeing several counselors and he was even hospitalized once at a psychiatric facility. In October of 2012, he basically tried to drown himself by drinking too much water. A few weeks later, he took too many acetaminophen pills and he tried to overdose using those pills. Luckily, a friend of his found out he took the pills and called for help. He was clearly a troubled young man who was struggling with some dark things internally, but this is not uncommon. Depression rates for children between the ages of 12 and 17 have risen 63% since 2013, which is scary if you think about it. That's, that's a big increase. That's a scary statistic to think about. And yet, I don't feel like enough people are paying attention to this. Can you imagine if there was a study done that said cancer in children between the ages of 12 and 17 had risen 63% in five short years? How many people would be trying to find an answer to why that was happening? And once they figured out what the cause of that was, how many programs would be put into place for preventative measures to help these kids not to develop cancer so that they could live their lives fully? Why is nobody paying attention to how dramatically depression has taken over our children? Where are the preventative programs that are there to help children who are more susceptible to becoming depressed so that they can fight something. They don't have the resources to fight on their own. In 2012, with his parents' divorce still an open wound and his internal battles raging, he met a girl named Michelle Carter. They were both vacationing in Florida with their families. Conrad's aunt knew Michelle's grandmother and their cottages were just a few houses apart from each other. They began to hang out quite a bit while they were on vacation. And before they left Florida, they exchanged numbers. Even though they had discovered that they didn't live far away from each other, they both lived in Massachusetts, Conrad was in Metapoiset and Michelle was in Plainville, just about an hour away from each other. They didn't really ever see each other in person more than two or three times. There wasn't even any pictures of them taken together. They really maintained their relationship via social media and texting. So who is Michelle Carter? Michelle Carter was born on August 11th, 1996 in Plainville, Massachusetts. She was described by her classmates as outgoing, chatty, and excitable. She would often amuse her classmates with jokes, and she was actually voted most likely to brighten your day in her senior superlative. Although Michelle was generally liked, she didn't seem to have a friend group or any close friends. But she was always trying to make friends or connect with other people her own age. When she was eight or nine, she allegedly developed an eating disorder, which she was hospitalized for in 2011. She was prescribed medication for depression when she was 14. And the people she went to school with pretty much knew about her mental issues. She didn't really try to hide it. She kind of used these issues in order to gain sympathy and attention from her fellow classmates. They noticed also that her weight would constantly fluctuate and she would make comments about being treated at McLean Hospital, which was a psychiatric facility in Belmont, Massachusetts. The people who knew her said she was pretty naive about things like sex, drugs, and alcohol, but she was very smart and she kept excellent grades in school. Now here's my opinion of Michelle Carter. I don't know the girl personally, obviously, but I have spent days and days reading her text messages to Conrad to Conrad's family, to friends or people she wanted to be friends with. And here's my general opinion of her. Michelle was a girl who was hungry for attention. Michelle was a girl who was almost starving for some kind of human connection 
to other people her own age. Actually, to anybody who would give her the attention that she craved. As a result, she would almost force herself on people, her desperation being pretty clear, which would in turn cause some people to withdraw and pull away. Her texts to girls at school were constantly her initiating the conversation, and if they didn't respond, she would send text after text after text until they did. And even if they responded with one or two word answers, she would respond with paragraphs. She would ask these girls if she wasn't getting the responses she wanted or if the responses were short, she would say, am I annoying you? Or do I annoy you? Can I ask you a question? Am I annoying you? And they'd be like, no, you're not. In these conversations with girls she wanted to be friends with, she was constantly bringing up her eating disorder or the fact that she was cutting herself. She would make comments about it and then wait for them to ask her about it. She was always saying, oh, I haven't eaten today or I haven't eaten in a couple of days. I don't know why, I just don't feel like eating. So that they would then come to her and say, Michelle, no, you need to eat. You know, you need to, you need to eat something. You need to take care of yourself because they were well aware of her eating disorder, everybody in school pretty much was. She basically held these people captive by annoying the hell out of them, yet they didn't want to pull away and shut her down because they were people who felt bad. They were worried about her. They wanted to help her, but they didn't really enjoy talking to her, but they wanted to help her. So they would continue to kind of, you know, minimally talk or offer her some help, but she was able to tell when they would start pulling away and she would draw them back in with another cry for help. Needless to say, these two people, Conrad and Michelle, both struggling with their different mental and emotional battles should probably not have maintained contact. When you're an addict or an alcoholic in a rehab program, they tell you don't get into a relationship with another addict or another alcoholic because not only can you guys not help each other when you're trying to help yourselves, but it's just a bad and toxic relationship to have. You end up talking about your drug of choice. You end up obsessing or talking about alcohol. You end up, if you have a mental disorder and you're very close with somebody else who has a mental disorder, you end up kind of focusing your conversations around your mental issues. And instead of having hope or moving forward or thinking about something else that will distract you, you end up kind of dwelling on these issues that you have. Anyone who is struggling with something like depression, suicidal thoughts, alcoholism, addiction, they have their own battles to fight and they're not in the right headspace to help you with yours. And the conversations with Conrad and Michelle, they start off pretty normally. A couple of teens just discussing life and school and friends and things like that. But they do shortly after beginning their communication, start discussing Conrad and Michelle's own separate mental issues. They talk to each other about how they're feeling, what they're going through, and it's not long before Conrad starts expressing to Michelle that he's considered killing himself and he's still thinking about it. At first, Michelle does what a normal person would do, what a good friend should do, and she discourages him from having these thoughts. She tells him, that's not the answer. You're going to be okay. You just have to have hope. You have to get help. You should check yourself into the same psychiatric hospital that I'm at, and we can get help together, which is great. We're off to a great start. She's doing what a sane person would do. She's doing what somebody who has a good moral fiber would do. And she's telling him that life's worth living, that killing yourself isn't the answer. There's so many ways you can get help. However, I have to ask the question, why would you keep this to yourself? Your friend is telling you he's considering killing himself. He's tried it before and he wants to die and you just keep it to yourself. You don't tell anybody. Okay, let's give her the benefit of the doubt, right? Let's say she didn't think it was that serious yet. Let's keep going. So this is where I am going to refer to the document that has the text messages between Conrad and Michelle in it. So on June 1st, 2014, Conrad is talking to Michelle about his social anxiety problems. This is at 3.52 PM. He says to her, I have social anxiety. Michelle responds, I know you do, and I wish you didn't. There's no need to. What exactly are you afraid of? And Conrad says, I try so hard for people to like me, and people don't. Michelle responds, well, I like you. 
And Conrad says, I know. I've learned a lot about myself over the last few days. And then Michelle says, and maybe you shouldn't try so hard. Just let it come naturally. Not everyone is going to like you. You have to realize that. You can't please everyone. Just live your life, not worrying about what other people think of you. And keep the people who do like slash love you and care about you close because they are the ones who matter. And then she asks him, and really, like what? In response to him telling her he's learned a lot about himself over the past couple of days. Conrad responds, yeah, I've heard it many times. I don't know how to believe it though. I want to be normal, but what I learned is that I have to accept who I am, so I don't get depressed about who I'm not. She responds and says, I know what you mean. Like, I try to make everyone like me too. To be honest, I don't even have like a friend group or anything that I hang out with. I'm just like friendly to everyone and I don't really hang out with people a lot outside of school. But I know who my friends are and I know they love me as much as I love them. I know you have certain friends that love you too and support you. And if you don't, then you will find them. But I'm so happy that you realized that, Conrad. That's great and so important. Like, you're absolutely right. If you don't love yourself and accept yourself for who you are, then no one will. This is the first step in getting people to like you. If you're confident with yourself and can accept who you are, then all the people who don't accept you can go suck a fat one because you don't need them in your life. You are normal. You just have a harder time talking to people. It's not a bad thing and you'll fix it in time, but being different isn't a bad thing. I'm different, haha, -ha, and I have issues, but I can accept that because it's who I am. Conrad responds to her, you don't like compare yourself to others because I do, but I can't help it. And Michelle says, no, I do all the time. She says, I think, why can't I be as pretty and funny and smart and stuff as them? And why don't people want to hang out with me? Because like people tell me they love me and they'd want to hang out, but they never make an effort to. So I always think like, why am I not good enough? Conrad then tells her a story about how he was staying with his friend Tom at Fitchburg State University for a couple of days. That summer, he did end up staying with Tom for a little while because Tom wanted him to see what the dorm life was going to be like for when he enrolled in the fall because they would be living together. And Conrad tells Michelle that he got social anxiety when he was with everybody. He said he felt awkward and jealous because everyone else seemed to have such an easy time talking and communicating and having fun, and he thought that they thought he was just kind of boring and had nothing to say. He said he felt like people were just being nice to him because he was Tom's friend and they liked Tom, but they didn't necessarily like Conrad. He ended up having an anxiety attack, not wanting to be around these people, and he left. He went back home. Now, Michelle encourages him at this point. She's saying, you know, you have to face your fear of social anxiety. Next time you're in this situation, just breathe through it and stay. And you'll get there little by little. She's actually giving him really great advice. He responds to her, yeah, but you know, when college starts, I'm going to be living there with these people all the time. I'm gonna have very little breaks from having people around. I just don't know if I can do it. That's when she urges him to get mental help. She says she's about to go check herself into McLean Hospital and he should go too. And then they can work through their issues together. They can be there together and deal with it. She says to him in a text, it's called McLean Hospital in Belmont, Mass. I honestly think it would be so good for you and we could get through our issues together. Think about it. You aren't gonna get better on your own. You know it no matter how many times you tell yourself you are. You need professional help like me. People who know how to treat it and fix it. Good advice once again, Michelle, great start. But Conrad responds to her and he's like, I'll talk to my parents, but I don't think it's gonna help. I don't think anything can help me with this. I'm on my medication again. That should be you know, kicking in within the next couple of days or a week. I'll be fine. Michelle responds to him, I don't know, I'm just scared. And he says, why are you scared? And she responds, for you. I'm scared for you that you aren't going to get better and you'll become suicidal again and stuff. Conrad responds to her with a sad face. Please don't mention it. I've thought about that once in four days and I know it's not an option. Michelle responds to him. Okay, good. I'm sorry. Promise me right now that you won't. Conrad responds, no, there's no way. And Michelle responds, thank you. And then Conrad responds, it just upsets me sometimes. On June 19th, Michelle is in the psychiatric hospital and he texts her and asks if she can talk because it's urgent. And she said the soonest she can talk is 1.30 and to just hang in there. She texts him the same day at 5 p.m. and says, I didn't know you liked me that much before and I'm so sorry that I ditched you a lot. 
I should have realized what I had when I had it. The reason why I ditched you so much was because I honestly thought you were too good for me. I didn't think I was pretty enough or smart enough or anything that you wanted in a girlfriend. I just didn't think I was enough for you. I thought you deserved better. So ditching you was my way of trying to make you move on because I didn't want to hurt you and I wanted you to find someone better. But I realized how effing stupid that was and it made me realize how much I messed up. You made me so happy, Conrad, for the first time in my life. Being your girlfriend was everything I've wanted and more. I just took it for granted and I'm sorry. You were the first boy who made me feel loved and important and visible. And I want more than anything for you to be in my life forever. You're one of the best things that has ever happened to me. You still make me so happy and so proud and I want you to know that I'll never give up on you, even when you give up on yourself. I'll still be fighting for you, always. I know you don't want to date again, but I'll always love you. So what we're getting from these messages, right, is Conrad and Michelle have been talking since 2012. And at some point when they started talking after Florida, they got into a relationship, but something happened. They exchanged messages that weren't so nice with each other and they ended up breaking up. But then they would kind of on again and off again, reconnect, rekindle, talk a little bit, and then kind of float away from each other again. On June 19th, she texted him, the mental hospital would help you. I know you think they wouldn't, but I'm telling you, if you give them a chance, they could save your life. Part of me wants you to try something and fail, just so you can get help. Conrad says, I can't get better. I already made my decision. Conrad responded, it doesn't help, trust me. Michelle responds to him, so what are you going to do then? Keep being all talk and no action, and every day go through saying how badly you want to kill yourself, or are you going to try and get better? Conrad responds, I can't get better. I've already made my decision. Honestly, in my opinion, her using the words all talk and no action almost sounds to me like a taunt, you know, like um, a dare, combative. You're like, do it, you won't, you won't do it, right? All talk and no action. Something changed after that conversation in June. I'm not sure what it was but something changed. Instead of Michelle discouraging him from committing suicide, instead of her telling him what he had to live for, she started almost planting the idea of suicide in his head. On June 21st, she says, I'm scared when you get better, you'll forget about me. He responds to her, oh, and she says, you won't, will you? Because you did that in the past. I was there and helped you out and then you just forgot all about me. He says, I won't. On June 21st, he texts Michelle and says he feels like he will never get better. She responds to him, you're in a dark tunnel, but it's not going to last forever. You'll find the light someday and I'm going to be there to help you. You didn't F up your life and you aren't an F up. You're just lost, but you're going to be found again. I'll never stop looking. You're going to get through this, okay? I believe in you so much. I love you. He then says, yeah, I just have to take my time. I keep regretting the past. It's getting me upset. And she responds, take your life? That's what she responds with. He says, I have to take my time. And Michelle responds, take your life, question mark. No, he didn't say take, take his life, Michelle. He said he's got to take his time to get better. And you responded back with, take your life? I mean, it's not as if she misheard him. It's a text. She didn't misread it. She literally just came back with, oh, did you, did you say you wanted to take your life? <laughs> He then responds to her with, do you think I should? She then says to him, you're not going to kill yourself. You say all the time you want to, but look, you're still here. All the times you wanted to, you didn't. You don't want to die. You just want the pain to stop. And Conrad responds to her, that's true. So he's saying, I don't want to die. I do just want the pain to stop. Then on 625, they're texting again. And he says, the past three days, it's been in my head. It's all I can think about. And she responds, think about what? killing yourself? Once again, Michelle, he didn't say that he was thinking about killing himself. He might have meant he's just thinking about his social anxiety issues. He might have been thinking about, you know, how bad he feels about himself or just about his depression in general. But once again, she comes back with, what, you're thinking about killing yourself, Conrad? He responds, yes, but if I do something, I'll let you know. And she responds to him, you're not going to do anything. You always say this. And Conrad says, you don't know that. Once again, she's challenging him. Do it. You won't. She texts back to Conrad, can I ask you something? If you don't have any hope of getting better, then why are you holding on for so long? I think deep down you have a bit of hope that you'll recover from this and you aren't killing yourself because a part of you knows you'll get better. Because if you didn't have any hope, you would have already did it. 
Conrad responds to her, if I didn't have a family that loves me, I would have already. I feel like I have nothing to live for besides that. And Michelle responds to him, well, what about me? <laughs> she has to make everything about herself. She needs constant validation that people like her, that she's cared for, that she's important to them. Constant validation. The guy's literally talking about maybe not wanting to kill himself because he has a family to live for. And she's like, what about me? Aren't I important? Tell me I'm important. Then on June 26th, Michelle talks to Conrad about a girl named Ellis, who she spent her entire therapy session that day talking about. Now, apparently Alice ruined Michelle's life. There is a whole backstory with Alice, but it's not super relevant to this case until the end, I think. So I'm not going to go into that. You can look it up if you want. But basically, Michelle tells Conrad that she has feelings for Alice or she thinks she had feelings for Alice. And he's like, what? Are you like bisexual? And she's like, I don't know. I think maybe I just had like bisexual feelings for her, but I don't think I am. Are you okay with that? And he's like, yeah, you know, whatever. And she's like, thanks for accepting me. And then she says, well, it's not like me and Alice would have been together forever, right? Cause I have you now. And he's like, I guess. And she's like, what do you mean you guess? And he's like, if I can get myself out of this mess. A few minutes later, Conrad says, we should be like Romeo and Juliet at the end. And Michelle responds, I'd love to be your Juliet. And he says, yeah, but do you know what happens at the end? And she responds, oh yeah, F no, we are not dying. He tells her he's just kidding. And she says, I thought you were trying to be romantic. Then Conrad tells Michelle that he just took his sleepy pills and he might be passing out soon. So he's just warning her that if he stops talking, he probably just went to sleep. He ends the conversation by saying, I just wish things were back to normal and I could feel happy again and not worry about other people and just love me. That's all I want, to be able to love me again. On the 27th, June 27th, he tells her he signed up for this social media site where you can talk to people, other people who are going through similar emotional or mental issues as you are, and that he's made a new friend on there, a guy from England who has been really helping him. She's like, that's great. I'm so happy for you. Is he better at giving advice than me? And Conrad's like, no, it's not about that. He's just like going through similar things as I am. So it's helpful. So once again, Michelle's got to bring the conversation back to her. Not great. You're talking to somebody who can help you because I've been trying and clearly it's not working. So you are now talking to somebody who can help you, who's going through similar things. But like, is he better than me? Do you like him more than me? Like, is he more important than I am? On June 29th, Conrad tells Michelle he's been researching ways to kill himself, that he's going to do it. He tells her he tried water intoxication and that didn't work. She comes back with, I just don't get how you failed the attempt. I don't think you really want to do this. He says, what do you mean failed the attempt? And she asks him, how did you fail the water thing? He responds to her, I read a thing where if you drink enough water, it could be fatal because it lowers your sodium levels. I tried drinking all the water I could and nothing happened. Michelle responds with, that's a stupid way because your senses won't let you drown yourself. Your body and mind won't let you. He responds, well, I want out bad. She says, well, why haven't you done it already then? I know you don't really want to die. She's challenging him again. You don't really want to die. You're not going to do it. Do it. He tells her he's been looking up ways to die where it looks like an accident because he thinks if he dies in an accident, it will be easier for his family to handle than if he commits suicide. She says to him, so if you didn't care about what others thought, you would have killed yourself the easy way. And he asks her, well, what's the easy way? She says, I don't know, hanging yourself or overdosing, I don't know. He keeps telling her he's never been happy. He has split personalities. He keeps copying everyone else because he can't be himself because he hates who he is. She asks him, well, what do you want to be? And he responds, you don't understand. I want to die. She then says, I know you want to, but I just don't get why you're holding on if you want to so badly. I know you want to and you research it and everything, but are you actually going to do it? He says, yes, if I can find a way that will 100% work. Michelle says, there is though, you're just afraid of doing it. <laughs> he tells her 96% of attempts, suicide attempts, end in failures. And she asks him, well, how badly do you want to be in that 4%? <laughs> Michelle goes on to say, I just don't get why you don't overdose again, but go somewhere private. He says, it's probably the most painful way to die besides burning to death. She says, what about hanging yourself or stabbing yourself? Conrad says, I have no place to do that. And Michelle responds, yeah, you do. She goes on to say, what about overdosing with sleeping pills or suffocating yourself with a plastic bag? 
Conrad says, well, I've thought about those things, but it's not 100% that they'll work. And Michelle says, well, you've already said yourself that nothing's 100%. Sleeping pills would work. Conrad asks her, really? And Michelle says, yeah, if you take a really huge amount of them, you'll fall asleep and never wake up. You say you want to die so badly, Conrad, but you aren't willing to try any ways to die. You said nothing was 100%, so all the kids in the world who have committed suicide knew that too. But they tried, and they were successful. On June 30th, Conrad tells Michelle that he thinks he's going to try today. And the kid from England is trying to help him figure out a way to do it. She says to him, is this kid serious? Which was my reaction to. He says, yeah, his friend tried this thing and it worked, so I'm going to try it too. She asks him, if his friend committed suicide, shouldn't he be talking you out of it, not helping you plan it? Which is ironic, considering she's been helping him plan it, suggesting, like, maybe you should stab yourself. What about suffocating yourself with a plastic bag? Is, is she for real? He tells her he's going to order some poisonous seeds online, because that's what the kid from England told him that the kid from England's friend did. So he's going to order these poisonous seeds online. And Michelle's like, just drink bleach. You know, she's competing with the guy from England on who can give Conrad the best way to commit suicide. Literally minutes before, she was like, why is he helping you plan this? Shouldn't he be talking you out of it? And then she's like, no, 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 poisonous seeds, that's not going to work. Why don't you drink bleach? This girl's whacked. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know I shouldn't be giving so much of my personal opinion about her right away, but she's whacked. Conrad tells her that he went to the therapist that day and he talked about life and she asks him if he told the therapist that he was going to kill himself and he said, lol, no, why would I? And she says, you're not going to do anything today, are you? He says, probably not, you're right, I'm all talk. So at this point, he's saying, yeah, I'm probably not going to kill myself, I'm all talk like you said, you know, we're good. And she goes on to taunt him and bully him and make him feel like a failure for not being able to commit suicide. She says, I thought you were really going to because you've been researching ways. A little later in the conversation, she says she wants to see the fireworks with him on Friday, which would have been the 4th of July. And he says he can't because every 4th of July, he works with his father and his grandfather and they basically bring the fireworks out to the barge. And she says, I take it you're feeling better. And he responds, a lot better. Then she goes on to ask him, are you serious? And he says, yeah, I'm like back to normal. And she says to him, you can't change overnight. Like two days ago, you wanted to die and now you're all better. Like she's mad. She's mad that two days ago he wanted to die and today, today he doesn't want to die. And she just, she can't have that. On July 1st, she says to him, I just want to make sure you're actually going to do it. Or if you're all talk, because I need to get myself prepared. I tried the best I could and I can never talk you out of it. So at this point, at this point, at this point, if you feel like you've tried everything you can and you cannot talk your friend out of committing suicide, now's the time to get somebody else involved. Now's the time to call his mother. Now's the time to get him help that you clearly just said yourself, you cannot give him. But Michelle Carter doesn't do that. Later, after he tells her he's been thinking about killing himself again and will probably do it when he gets back home, she asks, is tomorrow it? And he says, what? And she says, you said you were going to try when you got back home, that's tomorrow. He answers, yeah, I'm mentally drained. And she says, I don't think you're gonna actually do it. And he says, think what you want. And she says, well, if tomorrow's going to be your last day alive, I wanna talk to you all day. And he responds, sure, I'll talk to you. And she says, wait, hold on, are you serious about this? And he says, I've been serious. So she responds to him, yeah, but tomorrow's the day. And he says, either that or Friday. And she goes, well, today now, it's 12.03. And he goes, yeah, you know. She says, I love you so much. And he goes, I love you too. And she says, I can't believe this is really happening. And he says, what? And she goes, you're actually gonna do this. Like, it's something exciting. Like, I can't believe this is happening. This is so exciting. So now it's July 2nd, the early morning of July 2nd. And she says, everything I do is gonna be for you. You're the love of my life. I always knew you were special. You're mine forever. And he responds to her, but my logic is I'm going to fail at it and do more damage to myself than what's already been done and end up going to a hospital for a while and doing everything over again. She responds to him, well, then don't fail. Do what you're most confident doing. Conrad responds, but if I'm not alive, how is it going to be for me? I just know Jesus is going to be with me no matter what I do. I haven't done anything really wrong my whole life. I just want him to take me with him and be an angel. 
Like if I do end up dying, I know I won't go to hell. I don't belong there. Shell responds, Jesus will take care of you, babe. You'll be happy and protected in heaven. I just want you to finally be happy. So, so happy. And if this is the only way you think you're going to be happy, heaven will welcome you with open arms. You're going to be the most beautiful angel there ever was. You're going to be my angel. You won't go to hell. I promise you that. Heaven needs a hero. So then Conrad and Michelle, they go to bed. But at 9.11 a.m., she texts him and says, okay, well, of course your family is going to grieve for you. I mean, whenever people lose someone they love, they grieve. And they are hysterically sad for a good month. But then it gets better, and they won't be as sad. They will always remember you in good times and memories. Your mom will definitely be sad and lost for a few weeks, but she will get better. And she has support from family and friends. She will know that you just wanted to be happy. And instead of crying for you, she will smile, knowing that you're in a better place. Your parents are not failures, and and they will not think they are. They tried everything they could, but your issues won. Yeah, they'll probably blame themselves for a while, but they will get over it and learn to accept it. They will live for you just like I will. They will be okay, I promise. I'll even call your mom every now and then and check in. <sighs> okay, so if it's my son and he's talking to this girl about killing himself and worried that it's gonna hurt his family, and the girl responds to him, your mom's gonna be sad for a couple weeks, but she'll be fine, she'll be happy for you. I would lose my mind. How dare Michelle Carter speak for Conrad's mom and say she'll be sad for a few weeks, but she'll be happy for you in the end? I can promise you that no mother who loses their child will be sad for a couple of weeks and then happy for them. How dare Michelle Carter speak for Conrad's mother and tell Conrad your mom's gonna be fine? I promise you that Lynn Roy, Conrad's mother, is not fine. I promise you that Lynn Roy's sadness and absolute devastation at losing her son will last far more than a few weeks. Later that day, Michelle texts him and asks, are you planning it out? And he says, yes. And she asks him, what method? And he says, I'm not sure. Then she asks him, when, tomorrow? And he goes, I don't know. Then Conrad sends her a link of a website that's titled The Best Way to Kill Yourself. And she responds to him, I just looked at it. That guy knows what he's talking about. Are you gonna try one of those ways? Are you gonna leave a note? He responds, yeah, I'm not gonna take any pills and I don't wanna leave a mess. So it leaves me with still a few options. She responds, you don't wanna try the sleeping pills? And what options? He responds, no. He said you'd need to save up for three months for it to put you to sleep and never wake up. She responds to him, not if you take a lot of alcohol. He asks her, who said? She responds, in the article, that's what it said. If you take a lot mixed with alcohol, it will relax you enough that you'll fall asleep and not wake up. He responds to her, I don't have enough and there's no refills. She says, true, and he goes, true. So she then asks him, well, what do you have in mind? And he says, well, three things. She goes, okay, explain. He says, I'll tell you once I'm in the process. She goes, what do you mean the process? And he says, don't worry, I'll let you know before. And she says, before you do it? And he says, yeah. Then he says to her, if you want, we can hang out tomorrow. And she responds, so you're completely serious about this? Like you're definitely doing it? Well, how would we hang out? I thought you were doing it tomorrow. And he responds to her, I'm probably gonna do it really late at night. She asks him, why late at night? And he responds, I feel like that's the best time. I don't know, I wanna see you again. She goes, will seeing me change your mind? He says, I don't know, I'd rather spend the day with you than alone. This is still July 2nd. She texts Conrad and says, can I ask you something? And he says, of course. And she says to him, are we basically dating? And Conrad said, how does that make sense? And she says to him, well, even when you're not my boyfriend, I still know you are. And Conrad says, you expect me to fail, right? She says, yeah, kind of, why? I just don't think you're going to really try. He says, well, I'm more confident in doing it now. Probably because she keeps telling him he's not going to do it. She responds to him, and I'm starting to believe you. That's the sad part, but you didn't answer my question. He answers her and says, well, I'll be with you up there someday. She says to him, you're basically my boyfriend. You're mine and I'm yours. Ha <laughs> ha. When you die, a part of me is going to die too. I always thought you were going to be in my life forever. I thought we were gonna grow old together. I never imagined it was gonna end this way, but you'll be in my heart forever and I'll always look up at the sky and smile at you. He responds to her, and I'll be looking down at you smiling back when you accomplish all your goals and you fight your eating disorder and you'll be able to love your body and especially yourself. July 3rd, he says he's going to kill himself and he says to her, um, 
you know, good night, I'll see you in the next life. And she responds back to him, Conrad, answer me, please, I fell asleep, I'm so sorry, that's not how you say goodbye to me, this isn't funny, answer me right now, Conrad, I love you so much, please say you love me back, this isn't real, right, you're not actually doing this right now, are you? You know, she doesn't care if he kills himself, just not before saying goodbye properly to her. I'm so sorry I couldn't save you, please come back, this is not happening, you're my best friend, you're my boyfriend, I love you so much, please don't leave me. So she's texting him all of this at 12.25 a.m. And then at 9.36 a.m., he texts her back and he says, hey, sorry, I just took some sleeping pills and fell asleep. She gets pissed. She writes back to him, so it didn't work? That's such a lie. You said you wanted this bad. I knew you weren't going to try hard. I feel like such an idiot. And he says, why? And she says, because you didn't even do anything. You lied about this whole thing. You said you were going to go to the woods and do it. And you said things that made me feel like maybe you were actually serious. And I poured my heart out to you thinking this was going to be the last time I talked to you. And then you tell me you took sleeping pills, which first of all, I know that's a lie because you already said you wouldn't get enough. And I don't know how you would have got them. I'm just so confused. I thought you really wanted to die, but apparently you don't. I feel played and I'm just stupid. She's mad because he didn't kill himself like he said he would. He responds to her, this poor kid, don't. I found out a new plan and I'm going to do it tonight. And she says, I don't believe you. You're going to have to prove me wrong because I just don't think you really want this. You just keep pushing it off to another night and say you'll do it, but you never do. She tells him, you're going to have to prove me wrong. You're saying you're going to kill yourself. I don't believe you. You need to prove me wrong and kill yourself. He responds to her, okay. She says, okay, what? And he says, I'll prove you wrong. She asks him, what are you planning on doing? Poison would work. And he responds to her, carbon monoxide or helium gas. I want to deprive myself of oxygen. She asks him, how are you going to get these things? He says, I wish I had a gun. She goes, would you use it? He said, yes. She says, do you know anyone who has one? And he says, I'm sorry I didn't do it last night. I just took a handful of pills and went to sleep. I don't know. I wanted to have one last good night of sleep and I did. She goes, don't be sorry. I understand that. I'm happy you got that good night of sleep because I'm just still kind of in shock that you're still here because I honestly thought you did it last night when you didn't answer back. He says, don't feel like an idiot. It's going to happen. She goes, tonight? He says, eventually. And she says, in all caps, see, that's what I mean. You keep pushing it off. You just said you were going to do it tonight and now you're saying eventually? And he says, by Monday. And she goes, is that the deadline? And he says, yeah, I promise. So to anyone who says that she didn't bully him or push him to do this, She's yelling at him because he didn't kill himself and he finds himself apologizing to her because she feels stupid that she believed he was going to kill himself and he didn't. I, I am now actually going to fast forward through because not only is this upsetting me to read these again, but um, it's much of the same. Just her getting mad at him when he says he's pushing it off, her giving him ways, researching ways that he can do it, giving him options, um, <laughs> it's just disgusting. So, um, so let's just fast forward to July 11th at 7.40 p.m. Conrad texts Michelle and says, what are you doing? And she responds, watching Glee. Ha ha, you? I, I feel like this may be the problem, Glee. I, I blame Glee for everything, honestly. It's such a bad show. He says, playing one last game of Madden. And she says, ha ha, aw, that's good. And he says, aw, I know, right? He says, can you do me a favor? And she responds, yes, of course. And he says, just be there for my family. And Michelle says, Conrad, of course I will be there for your family. I will help them as much as I can to get through this. I'll tell them about how amazing their son and brother truly was. I am so blessed and thankful that I got the chance to know you like I did and that you let me love you and that you loved me in return. And she literally asks him, like, when you die, can you give me some sign that you're watching down on me? Like when you're a ghost or a spirit? So this is July 12th now at 4.19 a.m. So the very early morning hours of July 12th, this is the day that he actually kills himself. And you will see that all day long, she bullied him and persisted in getting him to actually take action and be a man of his word. So around 4.19 a.m., Conrad texts her and says, hey, sorry, I fell asleep. And she responds to him, it's okay. Why haven't you done it yet though? And he says, I'm too messed up too. And she asks him, what are you talking about? And he says to her, my head. Michelle says, you can't think about it. You just have to do it. You said you were going to do it. Like, I don't get why you aren't. And he responds to her, I don't get it either. I don't know. She responds to him, so I guess you aren't going to do it then. All that for nothing. I'm just confused. Like you were so ready and determined. 
And he responds, I'm gonna eventually. So this is the day he commits suicide. He's saying, I'm too messed up right now. My head's a mess. I don't know why I'm not doing this, but I will eventually, you know, just not today. He said, I don't know what I'm waiting for, but I have everything lined up. I really don't know what I'm waiting for. And she says, no, you're not, Conrad. Last night was it. You keep pushing it off and you say you'll do it, but you never do. It's always gonna be that way if you don't take action. You're just making it harder on yourself by pushing it off. You just have to do it now. Do you want to do it now? He responds to her, it's too late. You know, it's 4.32 in the morning at this point. He says, I don't know, it's already light outside. I'm going to go back to sleep. I love you, I'll text you tomorrow. She responds to him, no, it's probably the best time now because everyone's sleeping. Just go somewhere in your truck and no one's really out right now because it's an awkward time. If you don't do it now, you're never going to do it. And you can say you'll do it tomorrow, but you probably won't. After she says this, he says, thank you. And she responds, for what? Are you awake? And he said, yes. And she said, are you gonna do it today? And he said, yes. And she responded, like in the daytime? And he asks, should I? And she says, yes, it's less suspicious. You won't think about it as much and you'll get it over with instead of waiting until the night. Then he asks her, yeah, then I will. Like where? Like I could go to an enclosed area. And she says to him, go in your truck and drive in a parking lot somewhere to a park or something. Do it now, like early. And Conrad says, didn't we say this was suspicious? And Michelle says, no, I think night is more suspicious. A kid sitting in his car, just turn on the radio and do it. It won't be suspicious and it won't take long. He says, all right, I'm taking Holly for a walk. And she goes, okay. So Holly is his golden retriever. And he took her for a walk that day. He texts her back like 10 minutes later and he says, I don't know why I'm like this. And she says, sometimes things happen and we never have the answers why. And he responds to her, like, why am I so hesitant lately? Two weeks ago, I was willing to try everything, and now I'm worse, really bad, and I, I'm not following through. It's eating me up inside. So he's telling her, I'm so hesitant about killing myself. I'm not following through. Why? And instead of saying, Conrad, because you probably don't want to kill yourself. You shouldn't kill yourself. I don't want you to kill yourself. She says, you're so hesitant because you keep overthinking it and pushing it off. You just need to do it, Conrad. The more you push it off, the more it will eat at you. You're ready and prepared. All you have to do is turn the generator on and you'll be free and happy. No more pushing it off, no more waiting. And he says, you're right. If you want it as bad as you say you do, it's time to do it today. And he says, yup, no more waiting. Michelle says, okay, I'm serious. Like you can't even wait till tonight. You have to do it when you get back from your walk. And he says, thank you. And she goes, for what? And he says, still being there. She says, I would never leave you. You're the love of my life, my boyfriend. You're my heart, I'd never leave you. He says, ah, she says, I love you. And he says, I love you too. Then she asks him, when will you be back from your walk? And he said, five minutes. And she goes, okay, are you gonna do it? And he says, I guess, I guess. He's not, he doesn't wanna do this. She says, well, I want you to be ready and sure. He goes, I don't know, I'm freaking out again. I'm overthinking. And she says, I thought you wanted to do this. The time is right and you're ready. You just need to do it. You can't keep living this way. You just need to do it like you did last time and not think about it and just do it, babe. You can't keep doing this every day. He said, I do want to, but like I'm freaking out for my family, I guess. I don't know. Michelle says, Conrad, I told you I'll take care of them. Everyone will take care of them to make sure they won't be alone and people will help them get through it. We talked about this. They will be okay and accept it. People who commit suicide don't think this much and they just do it. He says, I know, I know. LOL, thinking just drives me crazy. Exactly, she says. You just need to do it, Conrad, or I'm gonna get you help. You can't keep doing this every day. He says, okay, I'm gonna do it today. And she says, do you promise? He said, I promise, babe. And she said, and you can't break a promise. And you just go to a quiet parking lot or something. He said, okay. She says, go somewhere you won't get caught. You can find a place, I know you can. So then Conrad texts Michelle when he's on his way back from the beach that he went to with his family and he says that he's going to be home and then he's going to do it. And he's telling her he's worried, you know, about killing somebody else because he's going to put the generator in the back seat and he doesn't want them to hurt themselves when they find him and open the door. And she says, you're overthinking. They'll see the generator and realize you breathed in CO. And he asks, should I keep it in the back seat or front? And she says, in the front, you could write on a piece of paper and tape it saying carbon monoxide or something if you're scared. He said, I was thinking that, but someone might see it before it actually happens. She says, well, wait, the generator is going to be on because you'll be passed out. So they'll know you used carbon monoxide poisoning. It's not loud, is it? And he said, not really, LMAO. And she goes, okay, good. Are you going to do it now? He says, I'm home. She goes, okay. He says, ah. And she goes, what? He goes, I'm just stressing. 
She says, you're fine, it's gonna be okay. You just gotta do it, babe. You can't think about it. Okay, okay, I got this, he says. Yes, you do, I believe in you. Did you delete the messages? Yes, but you're gonna keep messaging me. She says, I will until you turn on the generator. He's saying, ah, I really, I don't know if I wanna do this. And she's like, don't think about it, just do it. How smart is that advice to somebody who wants to kill themselves? Don't think about it. You're overthinking this. I know it's your life. I know there's literally no taking it back, but you're overthinking this. You just need to do it. She incessantly texts him, just do it, just do it, just do it. Oh my God. She said, just do it, or when are you gonna do it so many times? I literally felt like it was a Nike commercial. I couldn't believe how many times she said, are you gonna do it? You're not gonna do it, just do it. It was, it was hideous. And she's telling him, delete our texting conversation. She doesn't want anybody to find out the things she's been saying to him. Did you delete? the texting conversation. He's like, yeah, but you're gonna keep texting me, right? He's terrified. He wants to know that his cheerleader, the, the cheerleader for his death is still there with him because he, if left to his own devices, would not have done this. If he was alone and he didn't have somebody in his ear for literally almost a month leading up to this day, saying, you gonna do it? You gonna do it? You gonna do it, Conrad? Just do it, just do it. If he did not have that, I truly believe this would not have happened because he was second guessing himself. He was thinking about it in great detail. He was worried about leaving his family. And more than that, I think he really thought maybe this isn't the best idea. So at 6.25 PM, he texts Michelle, I'm almost there. At 6.28 PM, a phone call is made between Michelle and Conrad and that lasts for 43 minutes. At 7.12 p.m., another phone call is made between Michelle and Conrad, and that lasts for 47 minutes. This call would be the last time Conrad would make a call on his phone or send a text from his phone because during this phone conversation with Michelle, he died. At some point during his conversation with his loving girlfriend, Michelle, he sat in his truck, rolled up the windows, and he, he was gone. Both of the calls between Michelle and Conrad, they bounced off of the cell tower located within one mile of the Kmart parking lot where Conrad took his life. That evening at 8.03 p.m., Conrad's sister received a text from Michelle Carter saying, hey Camden, this is Michelle Carter. Not sure if you remember me, but I'm dating your brother again, ha ha. She goes on to say that Conrad isn't answering her texts or her calls and she's worried about him. Do you know where he is, Camden? And Camden responds that she's not sure, she's not with him, but she's gonna ask her mom. And then she's like, how did you get my number, by the way? And Michelle's like, oh, Conrad gave it to me a while ago. Haha, <laughs> didn't mean to freak you out. At this point, Camden tells Lynn, Conrad's mother, that Michelle is looking for Conrad. Lynn Roy had met Michelle once in 2013 at one of Conrad's baseball games and Michelle had walked up to her and introduced herself, but Lynn didn't know they were dating. Conrad never talked about Michelle. She just thought this was one of his friends, one of his many girlfriends that he had because he was you know, seeing and talking to many different girls. So she's like, oh, this Michelle girl says that her and Conrad are dating. But Conrad that night had told his mother he was going to a different girl's house. So Conrad's mother, Lynn, was like, well, just tell um, Michelle that Conrad's at his dad's house. We don't want to tell her that he's with another girl and start something. We'll talk to Conrad about it later and iron this all out. Lynn Roy then texted Conrad about 10 p.m. to ask him when he would be home. And of course, he does not respond to this text message. And keep in mind, as Michelle is texting Conrad's family, asking where he is, do you guys know? She knows where he is. She knows he's gone. She was on the phone with him when he did it. At 10.36 p.m., Camden responds to Michelle and says, he's at my dad's house right now, so I texted my dad and he says Conrad is sleeping. Lynn fell asleep around 11 o'clock that night, but she did wake up at 1.30, noticed Conrad's truck wasn't in the driveway, and texted him to find out where he was. Now she says she wasn't too concerned because the week before he'd been with a girl and they'd had like a bonfire and he didn't get home till after two, but he never stayed out all night. So when he didn't respond to her at 1.30, she went back to sleep. She woke up again at 5.30, noticed his truck still wasn't there. She drove by the girl's house that he said he was with, didn't see his truck. She drove by her ex-husband's house, Conrad's father, didn't see his truck, and that's when she panicked and she called the police to file a missing persons report. 
So this is now July 13th. It's 10.04 a.m., right? Conrad's family is looking for him. They're desperately trying to find their son. They don't know where he is. And Michelle is texting Camden again and asks, is your mom mad at me? And Camden's like, no, we just, we don't know where Conrad is. We're looking for him. <laughs> is your mom mad at me? Michelle is always wondering how people feel about her. Is somebody mad at me? Am I annoying you guys? Am I texting you too much? Did I do something to upset you? No, nobody's mad at you. They're stressed out because they can't find Conrad. At 10.17, Michelle says, I'm going to help you come look. I'm just waiting for my mom to come home. And she literally keeps inundating Conrad's sister Camden with texts. And she's not getting responses or she's getting one word responses, but she keeps texting. And she says, did you find him yet? Camden says, no. She says, okay, just stay positive. Let me know. When was the last time you guys talked to him? Camden says, last night. Then Michelle again is like, have you found him yet? And like, what time last night? Camden's like, listen, another friend's helping us look right now. Like, we've got this. And Michelle's like, what friend? What friend? Somebody is helping you? Somebody is supporting you other than me? Oh, no. And did I mention that after she sat on the phone with him and listened to him die, Michelle continued to text Conrad's phone. At 9.19 in the evening of the 12th, she's texting him saying, please answer me. I'm scared. Are you okay? I love you. Please answer. Then at 10.38 p.m., she writes, you're at your dad's. Camden told me. I'll get you help soon, I guess. I thought you actually did it. Now, at this point, I don't know if she's covering or if she actually thinks maybe he didn't go through with it. But either way, kind of sketchy. The next morning at 10.01 a.m., she texts Conrad again and says, I'm going to tell your mom you need help. I can't stand to see you this way anymore, and I can't live like this. You need to get help whether you want to or not. And at this point, I think she knows he's gone. I think she knows he's gone because these two kids spend every day and night texting. Like they would text until one, two, three in the morning, fall asleep and wake up a couple of hours later and resume their texting. He had not texted her all night. She knew he was gone. Now I think she's trying to cover. And never once does she tell Camden or Conrad's mother, Lynn, you know, he was talking about killing himself. He was actually trying to do it. He was trying to find a parking lot. You know, I'm worried. She doesn't say any of that. Why? She literally acts like she hasn't talked to him and he's not answering and she doesn't know where he is. Fairhaven police officer David Carrara was dispatched to the home of Lynn Roy around 2 p.m. on the afternoon of July 13th. She gave him Conrad's description, showed him a picture, gave him the description of the vehicle Conrad was driving as well as the plate number. And David Carrara, he issued a bolo for the surrounding areas, which is a be on the lookout. And he also filed a missing persons report. And then he kind of took it upon himself to go out and search for Conrad on his own. He called AT&T to have Conrad's phone traced. And Conrad's phone had pinged off a tower that was located on a local farm. So they kind of knew that it would be within a one mile radius of that area. And Officer Carrara started on Fish Island in New Bedford because the family had like a dock there. So he thought maybe Conrad would be there. When he didn't find anything, he started making his way back towards Fairhaven. As he was driving back towards Fairhaven, he saw a black truck, which matched the description of Conrad's truck. And he thought maybe this is Conrad. So he started following the truck, trying to get close enough to see the plate to see if this was the truck. This truck, which ends up not being Conrad's truck, obviously, this truck leads him to the Kmart parking lot where Conrad's truck is actually parked. And as Officer Carrara is driving through the Kmart parking lot following this other truck, he sees Conrad's black F-250 out of the corner of his eye. He looks a little closer and notices that the plate does match Conrad's plate. He pulls up, parks behind the truck, he walks over towards the driver's side and he sees Conrad in the car, slumped over the steering wheel, clearly not alive any longer. He called in for backup and he also called to the fire department because he noticed that there was a generator inside and because of the carbon monoxide poisoning, they had just been trained because of another isolated incident that had nothing to do with Conrad, but they had just been trained that if something like this happens, you have to wait for the hazmat team to come and clear the vehicle so that you're not putting yourself or anyone else in danger when you're opening the vehicle. The fire department did send somebody who cleared the vehicle, said it was okay to open the door, and they opened the door. They found Conrad in the car. He had no pulse. He was already in a process of rigor mortis 
and they noticed his skin was kind of a cherry red as opposed to a purplish red, which typically happens when lividity sets in. His skin was a cherry red because of the carbon monoxide inhalation. Conrad was wearing a baseball cap and sunglasses, and he had a cell phone tucked into the waistband of his shorts. Officer Carrera took the cell phone and he put it into evidence, but they didn't have the code to the phone, so they couldn't look into it just yet. The family was notified and Camden let Michelle know that her brother had been found dead and had committed suicide. Michelle then texts Lynn Roy and says, I'm so very sorry. Conrad meant so much to me and he was loved by so many. If you and your family need anything, let me know. He was such a bright light, such a beautiful soul. Please stay strong. We are all here for you and your family. He was such an amazing son because he had such an amazing mother. I will talk to you soon. Michelle begins texting with Conrad's mother and sister quite a bit, asking about the funeral, asking about the arrangements, offering her support, offering to come by, which everybody thought was kind of strange because Michelle had never been to their house when Conrad was alive, so why would she come over after he was dead? The Monday after Conrad's body was discovered, a detective gets his hands on Conrad's phone. And this is Detective Scott Gordon. And I believe that Detective Scott Gordon is the real life Detective Gordon from Batman because this guy, he knew something was up and something was wrong. And he dove deep into this case. 